You're listening to LeaderCast, episode 144. Welcome to LeaderCast, Transforming Missions podcast with Tim Bias and Sarah Thomas, providing you with insights and resources you need to lead a movement of Jesus followers. That's how it should work, people. We are the body of Christ. This is how uh, these pieces should work. So what you hear in me is both the athlete who's going to get up every morning and stay consistent and be competitive and be there at 7 a.m., Every single time, and you hear the coach in me that says, and not me alone, but everybody else around me, because in order for us to win, in order for there to be victory, I want to see victory in everybody's life, not just my life. Today, we're having a conversation with Rachel Billups. We talk about partnerships within the congregation, with other pastors, with other churches. We talk about kingdom leadership, courageous leadership. We talk about pace setting and recognizing the gifts in others. We talk about diversity and the kingdom of God. And oh, yes, this thing that we're all doing right now, pandemic leadership. You're going to experience laughter. You'll likely pause. You might even hit the back button a time or two to listen to what you just heard again. As a reminder, you can find show notes for episode 144 at transformingmission.org forward slash podcast. Be encouraged as you listen to Rachel's bold and courageous leadership. Without any further wait, here's our conversation with Rachel Billups. Welcome, Rachel, to LeaderCast. Yay! Let's, I'm delighted to be here. Let's let's begin with a couple of tough questions. <laughs> who uh, who are you, and what do you get paid to do? Who am I? Well, I like to answer this question with first and foremost. I am a beloved daughter of the living God. I am the wife of John Billups and the proud mama of Adeline, Christopher, David, and Sarah. And what I get paid to do is I am the uh, senior pastor at Ginghamsburg Church in the booming metropolis of Tip City, Ohio. (laughs) And really, I'm part of the Ginghamsburg movement, and we have two locations across the Miami Valley. So, and really, our online location being beyond that. So knowing a little bit about who you are and and the work that you do, you're in the business of helping people become followers of Jesus. Amen. So, so, what, <laughs> so what does that mean uh, to you? You know, it's interesting. We're in the middle of really uh, rediscovering what discipleship really looks like. I mean, we're in a pandemic world, so all bets are off, right? And uh, particularly in this season, my entire leadership team, my leadership board, my lead team, and all of the director level staff that we have at Ginghamsburg are walking through a discipleship curriculum. Don't ask me the title because I'm not going to remember it, but a discipleship curriculum where we're relooking at the, not just the basics of what does it mean to be a disciple, but how do you genuinely disciple other people? I think for the most part, we know, hey, discipleship means following Jesus. You know, high five. We got that. We're going to make disciples. And then we're like, well, what does that look like? And we're like, well, you see, <laughs> I'm not sure about that. And so uh, we're trying to get back to our first love, which really is not only following Jesus, not only encouraging other people to follow, but actually walking alongside of real life human beings and helping them go from, I'm not sure who this Jesus person even is, to I am completely sold out in every area of my life to the cause of Jesus Christ. And I want to see his kingdom come from heaven to earth. So as we've been having these conversations with different leaders, part of what has been a joy for Tim and I, and sorry, Tim, I'm speaking on your behalf, is to see how each one of the leaders that we're having conversation with are navigating this pandemic time, to use your language, in unique ways, and yet at the very same time staying focused on Jesus and helping people to become followers of Jesus. And so one of the ways that I love to get at the unique qualities, the unique talents, the unique gifts of leaders is to talk about their Clifton strengths. Can you share with our listeners your top five Clifton strengths? Oh, absolutely. So my top five strengths are achiever, competition, uh, futuristic, now I'm going to think, command, and focus. Yeah, that's a list. 
<laughs> that is a list. And I think I've said this before to you, Rachel, when I look at your list of top five, part of what I see that sets you apart as a leader among the leaders that I have the privilege of working with is I only see one of those, maybe two, come up often in the leaders that I have the privilege of interacting with. And those two are achiever and, and futuristic. We're going to talk about one of those one of those talents that doesn't necessarily <laughs> come up <laughs> an awful lot and how you leverage that in, in just a minute. But before we do, as you think about those top five, how are your top five fueling your leadership in this season? Well, they make me fun at parties. <laughs> 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 no, I, you know, I, here's my favorite, probably my favorite strength uh, in terms of being a pastor is focus. I really do have this unbelievable ability to just really stay focused. I wasn't kidding when I said this morning I wrote a sermon. I just have this uncanny ability, no matter what's swirling around me, no matter how chaotic life seems, no matter what my four children are doing, my husband can testify to this gift because he hates it. I can just stay completely focused at the task at hand, you know? And so it really does give me an ability to step up and lead, particularly when everything around me seems really uh, like it's falling apart. So not just in this pandemic season, but probably uh, over the course of the last couple of years, that strength has served me very, very, very well. So I'm grateful for that. Uh, on the other hand, that grouping of, uh, I'm not just, I'm kind of kidding, uh, but that grouping of leadership traits and qualities is kind of unique uh, to a person like myself and in the role that I'm in. And so in some ways, um, it means that all bets are off. Like I get to creatively uh, discover what it means to lead with this particularly um, unique sets of gifts. So, and then be my own person, which, which is what I like to do anyhow, you know, command strength. So it, it really suits me well. So in the midst of all that has been swirling with your family, with the kids, with the church, what do you celebrate God doing in your life and leadership in the past three months? Even going back a little bit further, I've jokingly said uh, that this entire like last season of my life has been a sanctification process. So <laughs> <laughs> I didn't necessarily need to go through so many hard things to become sanct sanctified, but thank you, Jesus, I guess. And so in a lot of ways, it's given me an opportunity to really look at what matters, what matters to me, what matters as a follower of Jesus, what matters as a pastor of a church, what really matters? Like get rid of all the other junk. And there actually is freedom when you say, hey, I'm going to focus on first things. You know, I'm going to focus on the main thing. And because I have the strengths that I have, I don't have a lot of guilt when I don't focus on all the other stuff. I, I feel bad for all of those persons that have a lot more guilt than I do. But I don't because I can focus in on what I need to focus in on. So I would say the biggest gifts that, that I've had in this, in this season is just reclaiming, staying focused on Jesus and following Jesus in a very creative new way. Can we talk about how you're following Jesus and equipping other people to follow Jesus in a really creative <laughs> way in, in the midst of this season? And can we do that focusing on your competition talent theme now? Oh, yeah. We're, I say that, and I have to do this disclaimer as I say that, because you can't artificially separate out just one talent. So you might talk about other things, and that is absolutely wonderful to bring other things in. But to focus in on your competition talent theme, because I have heard you talk about competition in a way that many people do not talk about it or even begin to think about it. And so let me just remind our listeners what Gallup says about this talent theme, and then, then we'll dive in. Gallup's definition of the competition talent theme is this. People exceptionally talented in the competition theme measure their progress against the performance of others. They strive to win first place and revel in contests. So <laughs> you you can't you can't see her folks but she's she's doing the, the hands up that's me. So as I love to win. <laughs> <laughs> did you hear that? She loves to win. Yeah. But part of what I know about you yeah. is that winning isn't just about you. Yeah. 
So can wow. you frame for our listeners what competition looks like for you? And then Tim's going to share with us framing discipleship, and then we can run with it from there. So, so what's really interesting about my competition strength, you know, I think a lot of people, when they think about that competition strength, they're like, oh, that person wants to win at all costs. They're always competitive. And let me reassure you, yes, I am always competitive. But when I think about leadership and my, like the way that I like to win, I don't like to win alone. In fact, I have been a run, runner most of my life. I discovered running at 12 and ran in uh, high school and in college and still run to this day. And one of the things that I discovered very early on about running is that when you're running, it is no fun if you're part of a cross country team to be the fastest runner and to be way, way ahead. If you're all by yourself and you win, but the rest of your team stinks, um, it's a lonely life. But if you have this team that is pacing together, what we call pace team, and you're all running your best and you're all doing really, really well and you are like one of the fastest teams on the track or one of the fastest teams on the course, then suddenly when, when you win the race, you don't just win alone, you win together. And uh, so for me, I, I, some days I'm not going to be the, the, the pace runner. I'm not going to be the top runner, but I'm going to be part of that incredible team that's winning. And so for me, I like to win with other people, not just all by myself. <laughs> and so I think that's what makes my competition strength a little bit unique is it's not just a kind of an isolated deal. I need people. Rachel, we talk about disciple making process with the acronym HOPE. Mm -hmm. And that includes hospitality. It's reaching out and receiving people. That's the H. The O is offering Christ. It's, it's offering relationship along the way, developing relationship and then offering people that relationship with Christ or a commitment to, to Christ. We, we talk about it in terms of practices, whether that's what those practices about worship, spiritual disciplines, means of grace, or ways in which we're learning together to be uh, followers of, of Jesus. And then we talk about it in terms of, of engagement, engagement in service, engagement in the community, so that H-O-P-E, hope. So using your competition strength and talking about a uh, system of discipleship, that's what we want to hone in here on just a, a moment. And I think Sarah has some questions to ask as we begin to talk about hospitality, offering Christ, practicing, and an engagement. As a leader who's constantly building relationships with new people <laughs> and seeking to deepen relationships with other people, when has your competition talent theme helped you develop those new relationships? When doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, maybe a better question is, how does it? Yeah, I think one of the things that it makes me do is it makes me see like the skills and talents in other people. And whether that's like my staff team or whether that's new people that I'm encountering, there is this desire within me. Remember the pace team? There's this desire in me that says, how can I maximize that person? How can I make that person their best? How can I like push that person, not break that person? There's a distinction. How can I push that person so that they can move further faster, right? So that they can move and be a part uh, of the pace team. Because I hope everybody has discovered if you've been in ministry or leadership for any length of time, it you know, you might go through uh, a series of things in your business or even in your church where you're like, well, I just need the right person, right? And you you sometimes can rifle through a series of people because I'm just looking for the right person. But the reality is a lot of times the right person is right in front of you. You just got to do the hard work of training that human to know how to run, training that human to know how to share their faith, training that human to know how to pray, training that human to know how to read their Bible, training that human to know how to share their Jesus story with someone else. And so when it comes to my competition strength, I'm always trying to figure out really practical and yet creative ways to get people engaged in sharing their story and praying. I mean, there are a thousand little examples. Let's just take my prayer time. Tim, you were talking to me earlier about like, this is what you look like when you're on prayer time. Absolutely. So I have had this practice of praying for a very, very long time. I started uh, praying with a book 
of Common Prayer from the Episcopal Church uh, back in seminary, Duke Divinity School. And off and on, I would use the Common Prayer book. Now I use the prayer book, uh, Common Prayer, Liturgy for Ordinary Radicals, very similar, right? And so I, I would do this every day, and I started sharing it once in a while on Facebook. Well, two and a half years ago on Holy Week, I decided to start doing this the entire Holy Week. And after like the third day, I realized, snap, this is a thing, right? Like, you know, 800 people hadn't watched it. And I'm like, oh, people like to pray. Imagine that. You wouldn't know it by going to church, but I guess they really do. (laughs) And so so what I realized was not only within that prayer practice, like you will, if you get on my prayer time, you'll notice that people are literally in the comments praying for one another. So I'm teaching people how to pray for each other. But in addition to that, before COVID, I had, even during COVID, I'd have people say, hey, you know, they're from New Jersey, they're from Florida. I want to do what you do. Can I do that? As though I own Facebook, right? (laughs) (laughs) As though I have any rights to any of that. Of course you can, right? So I'm always encouraging other people to think creatively about how they too, pastor, how you too can empower your people to get excited about prayer or You know, I remember one time, Sarah, um, Marie, who's part of our covenant group, Pastor Marie, wanted to do a Bible study online, and she asked me for permission to do it (laughs) because I was doing this stuff online. I'm like, hello, go for it. Like, get after it. Because when it comes to the wide, wide world of technology, we've got to have this sense that we can fail and get back up and fail and get back up and fail and get back up because stuff that we're doing today, like there's going to... My prayer time has a shelf life. Someday the Lord's going to say, Rachel, you got to do something else. Right now, that's not true because I've asked him many a time because I do it every (laughs) single day. I think it's important that sometimes in our kind of, in the culture that has been created around us, like we want followers, we want fans, we want to be, you know, famous, all that crap. I guess I can say crap on your podcast, all that crap, right? The reality is, no, that's not what we want. We want to be inspiring people to imitate us. Is that not what Paul said? Imitate me? (laughs) Because guess who I'm imitating? I'm imitating Jesus. So ultimately, my, uh, my prayer time shouldn't be about me or any other discipleship tool shouldn't be about the po- person who's using the tool, but rather, how are we replicating people who can do what we do? You know, someday I hope like I get put out of business when it comes to prayer because everybody else is praying and no one's listening to me. You know, that's how it should work, people. We are the body of Christ. This is how uh, these pieces should work. So what you hear in me is both the athlete who's going to get up every morning and stay consistent and be competitive and be there at 7 a.m. every single time. And you hear the coach in me that says, and not me alone, but everybody else around me, because in order for us to win, in order for there to be victory, I want to see victory in everybody's life, not just my life. So on that one, as you think about, well, I'll let you set the time frame, but I'm going to say in the last year, when I think about your description of competition being oriented around team success, mm-hmm. you know, your your team needs to win. The people around you needs to need to win. What's the greatest win your team has experienced this year? You know, it's easy for me to like point that out. Frankly, it may be not something that people see all the time, but from my perspective, it's just the sheer of amount of diversity that you experience when you tune into Ginghamsburg online, right? That we have been able to champion a diverse staff in ways. I'm not, again, competition strength that other churches <laughs> may not have been able to um, champion diversity. And so whether that's You know, I have one of my campus pastor, uh, the lead pastor at our Fort McKinley campus, uh, Pastor Carl, whether that's Marcy Walker, who's on our lead team, who's over all of adult discipleship, men, women, young, old, when you tune into Gingham, sir, you're going to get a very diverse uh, picture of the kingdom of God. And that diversity isn't just, oh, look at us on the platform. We're just like trying to be diverse. No, we are actually like embedding this. Number one, um, to model and embrace diversity is one of our core values as an organization. But also, we are having some really, really tough conversations around race, around LGBTQ+, so that we can, uh, we don't all agree on everything, 
Imagine that I'm in Miami County. And when I say Black Lives Matter, people kind of freak out sometimes. But I'm able to get in the pulpit and say, hey, wait a second. We don't live in an either or or world. We live in a both and kind of kingdom reality where I can say Black Lives Matter because if we want to say everybody's life matters, then we have to be able to champion that Black Lives Matter. But also when I say that, I'm not saying that, you know, I'm anti-police because the reality is we've got people right here in this room who are part of our security team, who are always keeping us safe, who are, you know, putting their lives on the front line. Do not allow yourselves to be divided by a country who wants to make you either or. We are both and people. Now I'm preaching, but whatever. (laughs) Yeah. So, I mean, this is this is one of the things that I'm just so proud of. And when it comes to diversity, I think what's so beautiful about it is if you're doing diversity right, no one feels excluded. Like, well, I'm I'm not this like I'm not a woman. I'm not a man. I'm not LGBTQ plus. I'm not black. I'm not that. So I can't be a part of that initiative. No. When we talk about diversity, we're looking at the mosaic that is the kingdom of God. You are an integral piece to this. What you bring to the table really does shape uh, what we look like and the rest of our God story. So helping people see value in what they bring to the table because of that has been really, really fun as well. Yeah, yeah. I kind of wish you could get excited about something right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank you. When it comes to inviting people to make faith commitments, what competition is in place for you right now in the midst of that? Is it a competition of, I know this isn't true, how many people can we get in the door? <laughs> Yeah. What's the competition that's at play there that led you to set a goal of reaching unchurched people in your community? Yeah, I think I think what kind of leverages my competition strength and maybe even keeps it a little bit in balance is kind of two thoughts. Uh, the one is I do have a spiritual urgency. I actually happen to believe that Jesus is the hope of the world, that God is redeeming and restoring all of creation that's beyond human beings, right? <laughs> like just saying. <laughs> but we we looked at uh, a few years ago, we looked at like a 20 minute radius of our church and we recognized like, oh my goodness, there are 270,000 people who say, I believe in God, kind of claim to be quasi Christian, but go to church nowhere, right? Sometimes we call those folks seekers. We've called them all kinds of things over the years. But the reality is there are just a lot of people in our community who are looking for hope. Something is missing. Something is broken. Something has changed. And so we we recognize that. And we're a little red hot about going out and interacting with people, hanging out with people, inviting people in. And the difference for us is we've learned over the years that Ginghamsburg doesn't have a monopoly on the kingdom of God. <laughs> You know, I I know sometimes that's really difficult for us to actually say and genuinely believe. But I think when you've been an organization that has been as large as Ginghamsburg Church, you can sometimes get so like navel gazing that you can be like, hey, this is it. We're it in some kind of way. But uh, through the last, uh, you know, 10 years plus, we've recognized, no, 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 this is a kingdom effort. And by the way, it's a kingdom effort not just by other United Methodist churches, but all Christians, all churches, we're in this together. And so I think one of the ways that we've been competitive in the sense of like, hey, we want to reach these folks, but not like, hey, Ginghamsburg only come to our church. We're the only like game in town is that I'm partnered with so many other pastors throughout the Miami Valley and we're partnered with other churches Um, that really it's really difficult to be partnered with other churches and other pastors and um, be like, no, 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 really just our church. (laughs) You know, come on here to this church. The other piece is we recognize that we can't be all things to all people, right? I I think sometimes we get so obsessed as churches, like someone gets interested in your church and they're like, well, what about this? Like, I I don't agree with this, or I'm not about that. Well, and we kind of try to shape ourselves into being what that person needs to us to be. Forget that. UBU, right? UBU. Guess what? I don't know if you realize it, but Gingham Sir Church has a senior pastor who's a woman. Oh, shocker. Like, if that's not your bag, you're not going to want to come here because we're like, I can't change that. And I don't feel called to change that in this moment. <laughs> so I'm being serious, though. Like, sometimes we shape shift just so that we can reach certain people and really determine 
what your focus is going to be and what we've determined our focus is going to be is actually children. We say that no child within our reach will go to bed without faith, family, or food. And so we're looking at all the kids in that same like new number of people. We're looking at ways in the next one year, the next three years, the next 10 years, we can reach X amount of children and all of these kind of things that we're doing so that, so that we're faithful to the call that we believe God has on our lives. Now, again, sometimes people get squirrely and they're like, what about me? You know, I'm not a child. Well, cool. I don't know if you realized it, but the only way that Christianity continues to, to thrive and spread is like one generation disciples another generation, the disciples another generation. So it ain't about you. <laughs> it isn't about me. I have a job to do, and that is to disciple a new generation of Jesus followers. And so what's seriously strange in this season is I feel like in some ways, Ginghamsburg Church is a big old children's ministry, a big old youth ministry, because suddenly we've had to let go of all of our own personal preferences and say, how can I reach this next generation? Which, oh, by the way, I was a youth pastor for like 30 seconds. So that isn't necessarily like, you know, my wheelhouse, so to speak. So related to what you've just said, not only in regard to being a runner and making sure that everybody finishes the race with you, you've just said that same thing in regard to being in partnership with churches. Yeah. And Rachel, that's not a, that's not normal. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, th- Tim, this is what's so fascinating. I think sometimes people, we're just getting honest here, right? When people meet me because, you know, I'm the senior pastor at Ginghamsburg Church, well, number one, when they first meet me, they're like, you're the pastor? You're the, you're the pastor? <laughs> you're the pastor? Hi, you know, like, pat me on the head, like, darling, you're the pastor of Gangazer Church? Yes, I've been told that before. <laughs> Anyhow, so so it's fa- that piece is fascinating because, that, like, that church on 75, like, that, that big church, so often large churches can become, oh, gosh, in... It, I don't think anybody does this on purpose. We can become so like a, a universe unto ourselves, right? That we forget, like the kingdom of God is the whole damn thing. The whole damn thing. Like the whole thing. And if we actually read the Bible and see what Jesus is talking about, like we would totally get over our stuff. So that we could be like, oh my goodness, the kingdom is so much bigger than me. And I just have a little function. I mean, I could, I could have 20,000 people, Tim, and still just have a barely function in the body of Christ. I mean, it just gives you such perspective. Like, but I still want to do my function well. And I still want to partner really well. And I still want to champion the people around me. And I still want to be on the team because guess what? It is so much more fun <laughs> to be on Team Jesus. When you are partnered with pastors, I just preached, I love this. I got an invitation from a new friend of mine. His name is Reverend Renard Allen. Reverend Renard is uh, the senior pastor at St. Luke Missionary Baptist Church. They don't even ordain women. Like they don't have women pastors. They don't have women preachers. And here I am, this white preacher who's going, this woman who's a white preacher who's going to preach at this Baptist church. And you know, they're like, oh, how's this going to work? And it was awesome. It was awesome because the people at St. Luke are awesome. The pastor is awesome. And when you experience that kind of kingdom kind of connection, some of Ginghamsburg people were there and St. Luke people are there and you're like fellowshipping together, you get a taste of heaven on earth. And you're like, oh, this is how it's supposed to be. We're supposed to get over all of our idiosyncrasies and uh, actually be the body of Christ in its fullness. Right. So. Um, so I'm crazy enough, naive enough, that's the word, to believe like we can actually taste that on the side of heaven and it to be oh so good. Oh so good. Or maybe Thank- you're courageous enough. I'll say thanks be to God. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Well, and this is what's so fun. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about discipleship and courage and boldness. Like faith means taking risk. You got to take risk. So this is how this started. Pat Murray, who's the pastor at Living Word here in the Miami Valley, large church as well, Pentecostal pastor, you know, family system. He was friends with Mike Slaughter, and he's been checking on me in these last couple of years. 
when George Floyd was murdered, he had this thing going on in his heart and he started a, a conversation with Reverend Allen and they had a meeting. Well, I went to said meeting and Reverend Allen, I said something, I was quiet the whole time because usually I am because, you know, I'm the new kid on the block. And so I don't say a whole lot because I don't feel like I need to say a whole lot. I'm perfectly comfortable in my own skin. We were at the end of the conversation. I had something I wanted to say, which I basically said, I believe it is my job as the senior pastor of a church like Ginghamsburg to not hoard the pulpit, to not hoard my power and privilege, but to give it away. Like, that's my job. Like, I actually believe that. I believe if I'm not helping train up the next successor pastor at Ginghamsburg Church, I am failing. I'm failing. Anyhow. So then Renard looks at me and says, I'm not asking you to give it away. I'm just asking you to freaking share. (laughs) And I was like, oh, I thought I was saying something profound. Now you just made me mad. (laughs) And so I thought to myself, I got to talk to this guy. So I reached out to him and he reached back and we've been in this beautiful relationship ever since. Like I just went through one door and then another door and another door. And oh, by the way, can you preach for me? And oh, by the way, he came, he and Dr. Bridget Witherspoon and they did a, a listen and learn on what it's like to be black in America with my staff team at our staff retreat, you know, like you just keep opening doors of possibility and you keep walking through them. And this going back to in this, the gift in this pandemic season, because I've been so centered in Christ, I don't care what people think. (laughs) Like, I don't care what people think about me. Oh, you think I'm a liberal? Well, I am. Oh, you think I'm conservative? Well, I am. I happen to be both liberal and conservative. I'm a Jesus follower, first and foremost. So anyhow, now you've got me riled up. <laughs> I said it a, a bit quickly, but I'm, I'm slowing down now because I want people to hear it. What you've just illustrated, Rachel, are courageous decisions that you've been making as a leader. Yeah. And helping folks to take that next step. And that next step, and that next step. Okay, Rachel, what characteristics of other leaders fuel your courage? What makes a good partner in leadership? Well, people who are willing. Well, and and I laugh about that, but the truth is, like, there are some people that are so caught up in their own stuff, or they're so caught up in trying to protect what is theirs, or they're so caught up in their own insecurity that they're not willing to partner. But it's the pastors who are centered, who know who they are, who knows who they, who they are and whose they are, that are able to partner because they're not worried about all that insecure. Like they, they're like, there's more and enough in the kingdom. And if I partner with you, I'm actually going to grow in ministry. And so I'm always looking for those people, you know, the scripture kind of calls them people of peace. And when you find a a person of peace, you partner together. But if you find someone who's hesitant, who doesn't want to partner with you, instead of getting your feelings hurt, because sometimes I get my feelings hurt because I want everybody to partner with me. You dust off your feet and say, ah, probably not the right person in this season, maybe some other season, but just not this season of ministry. But here's the other thing that I know. Every leader, even the best ones out there in this pandemic season are feeling isolated and alone. They're feeling lonely. And so anything that we can do as leaders to just stop what we're doing and encourage the people around us is super, 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 super important. So uh, a couple of weeks ago, I had this prompting of the Holy Spirit to just, I was in worship and I'm on the front row, which I feel a little bit bad about this, but I'm on the front row. And I just feel like this prompting of the Holy Spirit to like text a pastor that I know who I haven't talked to in a really, really long time. And I'm like, no, God, that's just a bad burrito. Like, no, but God wouldn't leave me alone. So I had to do it. And I knew it was just the right timing for that person's life. You know, I find out later, like what, what, what's going on. So I think it's really, really important in this season to, to just recognize that the worst thing that someone's going to tell you is no. (laughs) And then you just keep, keep asking, keep asking. No one's going to tell you no. Some people once in a while tell me no, but really. Most people don't tell me now. So out of what we've, we've been talking about here, I've learned something about you. And that is, in terms of this disciple process, and that is, if you invite me in, you're going to have me engaged. 
(laughs) You're not inviting me in for any other reason other than we're going to get you engaged. And it's in that engagement then you become more who you're you were created to be because that that i rachel you can't help yourself you're inviting people in because you're going to make sure everybody finishes the race and and if they lag behind you're going to run beside them and say let's just keep going because you're going to have them engaged so that uh, that's a wonderful for me a wonderful model for for ministry so thank you yeah yeah what i wrote down is which will probably end up being the title of this podcast. So if you've come to this minute in the podcast and you're saying, well, yeah, that's the title of the podcast. Here's why. What I wrote down is partnerships, reframing competition. (laughs) And that's what you've done for us today in terms of leading courageously, how God has gifted you and created you to empower and equip others to follow Jesus. So thank you for that. We're going to have an opportunity for you to offer any last words of wisdom that you want to offer to our listeners, but we want to do a rapid fire round of questions. And these are 10 fun, quick, off the cuff questions that will probably be short answers that we just we have been asking folks so that our listeners can get to know the person that they've been hearing share their passion and their heart for the past 30, 40 minutes, um, a little bit more about you, and maybe have a little bit of a laugh and a little bit of an encouragement too. So Tim's going to get us started, and we'll run through these 10 questions. What's your um, morning beverage of choice? Oh, black coffee, hands down. I drink half a pot a day. (laughs) Uh, we've asked this question uh, of, of at least eight people now, and no one has said Diet Coke. <laughs> Come on, Sarah. <laughs> I'm asking the wrong people to be on the podcast. Oh, no. <laughs> we've got a bunch of coffee drinkers. <laughs> and I think today, the people that we've talked to, there have been at least three of you that have been black coffee drinkers. Yeah, nothing in it. Straight up. You got to taste like it, what it really tastes like. Oh, see, I love the smell of coffee, but I cannot stand the taste of it. Mm. I can live. I can live vicariously. You just tell me what it tastes like. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Second question. What's your favorite or go-to Bible verse? Oh, second Timothy one, seven for the Lord did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power of love and a sound mind. Someone with a competition strength, maybe. (laughs) What's your favorite season and why? Oh, that's super hard. Everyone. I can tell you why I like the fall. I mean, I grew up in the Hocking Hills. And so like the trees in the fall are awesome. I cry at the first snow. I'm excited when the weather warms up because I get to run and it's not freezing. And in the summer, well, who doesn't love the summer? (laughs) I love it all. (laughs) When did you get your first Bible? You know, I think my first Bible came when I was baptized because I still have it. Like back in 1981 in my little country church that I grew up in, I have this little white Bible that I'm pretty sure is King James Version that I have tucked away in a box somewhere. And yes, I don't forget anything. So yeah, I know exactly where that Bible came from. (laughs) Yeah. What do people misunderstand about you? You know, I think a lot of people think I'm aloof or intimidating you know, a lot of people, I've, I'll be in a room full of people and no one wants to talk to me because blah, blah, blah. I'm Rachel Billups. I'm the senior pastor of Gang of Church, whatever. But I love humans. And when you get in my sphere of influence, like, you're like, who are you? You are nothing like I thought you would be. <laughs> what is the last thing that you read or what are you reading right now? Well... I'm constantly reading and I read multiple things at the same time. Like right now I'm reading The Color of Compromise. Actually, Jen Lucas, who will be on this podcast either before or after me, kind of turned me on to that. And my entire staff team is reading it. I'm rereading it right now. I'm also reading uh, T.D. Jakes is Soar. I love T.D. Jakes. I, I just think he's absolutely incredible. I'm reading Glenna Doyle's Untamed. I know all of this is super different. 
And then there's a, a lady, uh, I think her first name is Naomi Dowdy. She was a Pentecostal who was like a, a missionary and then started her own church that was like in India that grew to 5,000. And she has this little book called Moving On and Moving Up. And it's about like stepping into a new dimension of your leadership. So yeah, all kinds of different things at the same time. And yes, I'm reading all of those things right now. (laughs) What's your favorite snack food? Mm, That's a really difficult question because again, I like lots of different food. mm, Well, I like the caramel popcorn with the cheddar popcorn, you know, the mix. Uh, That's like my favorite ever. So popcorn, but those two together, particularly if it's from Chicago. Yes, please. What is your least favorite household chore? Mm, Least favorite. Well, I have four children, so they do all my least favorite household (laughs) chores for me. So uh, that's probably super choice. And my husband and I, when we got married, because we were children when we got married, we divided all the chores. So like he does all the dishes. So like, and the laundry. So what to do, what to do. (laughs) All I really do is house cleaning. But then I, I form a team that is my family and everybody cleans together because I want them to win in cleaning. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I think I know the answer to this one. When was the last time you laughed? (laughs) (laughs) Um, I try to laugh on a regular basis. I have a really funny husband too. I'm not the funniest one in my family. He really is. And so he keeps this pretty serious chick laughing. (laughs) I don't think that our listeners would know today that you're serious. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, last question. Favorite vacation spot or place to relax? Well, hands down, um, I probably don't have a favorite vacation spot. But I I tell you, I grew up in the Hawking Hills. And for your listeners, it is like the edges of Appalachia in Southern Ohio. And I love to be in the woods. I'm a, I'm a country kid at heart. And so when I'm in the woods, I can breathe. I mean, even today, my husband and I went on a, a walk at a prairie. And just so I can be outside, I feel alive. Thank you, Rachel. And once again, thank you for inviting our listeners to just pause for a minute and think about the partnerships that they're developing and really reframing competition for all of us as we think about how are we discipling the people that are around us and we have the privilege to live with and lead. So thank you for being with us today. Do you have any last minute words of wisdom that you'd like to share with our listeners? You know, I think like some people might be listening and be like, oh my goodness, how how do I find that courage? How do I find that boldness? How do I you know, like, you don't even sound like you've been through a pandemic. What on earth? Like, who is this human? And it's um, not the I, half I'll, a pot of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> I've only had like two cups today. So there's that. No, I think the reality is it's because it is my daily practices, my weekly practices, my monthly practices that keep me centered. Every day I'm falling in love with Jesus. Every day I am attuning my spirit to the movement of the Holy Spirit. Uh, I always say to people, if it wasn't for daily prayer time, if it wasn't for daily practice, I would be huddled up in the corner in a fetal position because I've been through some stuff in the last couple of years. But because of just the movement of the spirit in me, I just keep on keeping on. It really, like, people, Jesus works. Like, a relationship with Jesus actually works. Rachel, I, um, I'm i grateful for the experience today. I, we might call it a conversation, but it's been an experience. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and a very good one. And I, I'll be better for it. And I know that the people who have been listening to us will, too. Thank you. I'm, I'm grateful. I'm thankful, too. Thanks for asking. Today, here's my question, or maybe a better way to say it is an invitation for you. Today, and maybe over the course of the next week, the next two weeks, the next month, the next six weeks, my invitation to you is to keep your eyes, your heart, your ears open for that person of peace. Who is God inviting you 
into kingdom partnership with. It may not happen in the next five minutes. It might not even happen in the next five weeks. But as you continue to keep your soul open to what God is doing in your midst, it just might be that there's a kingdom partnership that God is inviting you into. Once again, you can find show notes for this episode at transformingmission.org forward slash podcast. To go directly to this episode, transformingmission.org forward slash 144. Now go lead a movement of Jesus followers. Bye for now.